Okay, good morning, everybody. Once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Stephen Kellum. I'm the president at CCI. Uh, today, we're joined by Kathy Contreras, who is a senior research director, uh, channel marketing strategies and serious decisions. Uh, say hi, Kathy. Hi there, everyone. Hope everybody's having a wonderful morning. Yeah, it's beautiful. Hey, it's a beautiful day here, so I hope it's nice for folks wherever they are. And so, that being said, we're gonna we're gonna jump right into the agenda today. Uh, and Kathy's gonna be walking us through the partner voice, how important that is. And as our title says, deciphering the voice of the uh, of, of the partner. So, Kathy, you want to talk a little bit about the agenda? Sure, happy to. Um, so first, we're going to, to really talk about the importance of that. Um, we're going to be looking at the goals um, of what you're trying to achieve with a voice of the partner um, initiative. And then we're going to break that down into what does that look like? What is voice of the partner? What are we referring to there? And then finally, just some tips and keys on how to get started. And this is a topic, gosh, Kathy, we could, we could boil the ocean on this thing, right? We could go down the path of for a long, long time about the partner voice, but we're going to try to do this in about 30 minutes, and we're going to try to give you guys some real value as we walk through this and give you some key things to think about and discuss and some, some good places to get going. But, you know, th this is a big topic, right? So we're, we're going to try to try to do everything we can in about 30 minutes. Yeah, I think there's a lot to cover, but we'll hit the highlights and, and hopefully spur some ideas for, for those on the bus phone and on the call so they can understand maybe how they can apply this in their own business. Absolutely. Okay, so serious decisions. Kathy, tell us a little bit about um, you and, and, your, and your group there. Thank you so much. So, um, Stephen, as you mentioned, I'm a senior research director in the Channel Strategy Service of Serious Decisions. We are a research and advisory firm. And just to provide a, a brief overview for those that may not be familiar with Serious Decisions, um, we deliver actionable intelligence, transformative frameworks, and expert guidance uh, that equip executives to modernize and elevate their sales marketing pr and product performance. Uh, we believe that the alignment of sales, marketing, and product is a delicate balance of art and science and the hallmark of high-performing organizations. From our perspective, our mission is to help our clients achieve this alignment. And through our work with hundreds of B2B organizations over the years, we continually refine our approach to help organizations achieve alignment that impacts their growth objectives. We have a number of services, one of which being the channel marketing strategy service I represent. Okay. So let's jump right into it. In, in the partner experience, partner voice, um, one of the reasons Kathy and I got together and decided to do this is, well, Kathy lives this every day w w with her clients, and we hear it everywhere we go. You know, Kathy, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with clients and they're talking about year of the partner. And so for me, all the questions around that are, what does that really mean, and how vested are the companies uh, in, in our clients and our prospects and actually following through on that and executing. Yeah, you know, it's really, it's really interesting. This is really important for companies. Some of them are starting to recognize this from an executive standpoint from the C-level down, um, and others are just starting to recognize the importance of it because it's actually causing some pain in their business. Um, when we look at organizations, B2B organizations, 65% of B2B organizations from our reports have indicated that they include indirect channels and partners in their go-to-market strategy. And even more are looking at adding either new channels or new partners in order to reach their growth goals. So the, the value of channels, the need of channels, is really critical to the success of these businesses. And what they find and what we share with them is that one of the key criteria that partners consider when they evaluate whether or not to add a new supplier's offering to their part, part, product portfolio or whether or not they're going to maintain a relationship with the supplier isn't necessarily purely just based on the product, the profitability of that offering. In many cases, what they're evaluating is how easy is that partner to work with and what's their experience of working with that partner is such a critical impact on the decision that the partner makes as to whether or not to maintain that relationship and, and actually continue to extend that offering through the market. Um, so we see this as something that companies, if they're not evaluating today, if they don't have a systematic approach of addressing partner needs and evaluating the experience level, the satisfaction level of the partners, it's something that they critically need to start to focus on um, just really across the board. Sure, and I think a, a great place to start, and, and Kathy and I were talking about this the other day, is 
it doesn't really matter whether you're cloud or whether it's traditional uh, sales. The voice of the partner and the, and the top goals are, are, are really, really the same. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the goals of, of a good voice of the partner is what you should be looking for is really focusing on improving well, evaluating first, but improving and maintaining a high level of partner satisfaction. Um, you know, that's where most companies are thinking about. Think about the voice of the partner initiative. It's really about making sure they're listening, right? And part of that listening is to, to confirm and evaluate and, and determine whether or not they need to invest um, within their business, within their processes, within their programs to improve the satisfaction of their partners. Now, that's not the only goal, though. The goal should not stop there. You should also be thinking about long term goals. Level of partner satisfaction has a direct implication and impact on while partners engage with you and how long they stay in within your relationships. Um, and so really focusing on the goal being partner commitment and loyalty over time. Um, and then finally, you know, the ultimate goal is to get your partners to actually serve as advocates. If the partners are, are very satisfied with the relationship, if their experience with you as a supplier is strong, they may be more willing to serve as advocates to the market to other partners and to the to the customer base that they serve or intend to serve, and that's actually the ultimate goal is to actually have your partners um, become strong advocates for you as a business, as well as for your brand. So as we get into the common elements piece here, you and I have talked about this a lot as well. The the bottom piece here, the partner advocacy referral programs, is kind of the end goal. I know you're gonna you're gonna divvy this thing up and and, and break it out in a moment. Uh, between between maybe the top section and, and the bottom section, uh, and maybe you could talk a little bit about <laughs> well why it's so important on the listening piece. You know, as we were going through this, and as Kathy and, and I were preparing for this, I think I took the listening on in the top line there. I think I took listening on my notes, and I, I put it in italics, and I put it in bold, and I underlined it, and I think I put it in red. <laughs> <laughs> So I just wanted to make sure that I didn't forget that, uh, and I know you're going to talk about this a lot, about how important that is, because if we don't do those top pieces really well uh, that fall into the listening category, we're probably not going to do real well on the partner advocacy piece. Absolutely. One comes before the other. One is sort of found foundational. When we look at voice of the partner, it's not a single initiative. It's not a single effort. Um, it really needs to be comprehensive. And so you'll see here are some of the critical and common elements. And Stephen, as you indicated, I have, if we can move on to the next slide, um, we'll share with the, the audience that, that we sort of group these because those first categories, all of those elements actually have to do with listening, both formal and informal listening programs. And listening is critical. Um, you know, this is where I see that some companies need some, some support, some focus around and rigor, is that it's not just talking to your partners. It's actually being bidirectional and being intentional and in listening to what they're saying, not only listening to what they're saying as a community, but actually repeating that to them in a way, being reflective in your listening so that you can make sure that, that what you've heard is what they meant, right? So there are a number of different ways that we, we think about doing this. We want to be comprehensive. So that may include things like advisory councils. If this is something you don't have in place today, consider adding those. Um, most companies do partner experience groups. We'll talk about best practices. We're going to sort of deep dive in each of these areas, provide a little more insight and guidance. Uh, partner interviews, thinking about how you're leveraging the relationships that are established um, between your business and your partners to actually um, do better listening and actually be more formalized and strategic and less ad hoc. And also thinking sort of a little bit outside the box, some companies do a really great job of leveraging other um, activities like communities and events that they sponsor for partners to actually gather insights. And so we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how to think about that and maybe some things that you may not be doing today. Um, and then, as Stephen indicated, um, you know, really, if, if this is this is one of the critical elements to think about. If you don't have um, the advocacy or reference programs as part of a voice of the partner concept within your business, um, think about adding those, and we'll talk about you know what those might look like. Okay, so starting off maybe with uh, partner advisory councils, and this could be a lot of fun, or <laughs> this can go a little bit sideways too. So. Uh, so good, a good place to start the whole listening discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you mentioned, we were talking about this topic earlier offline. And, um, you know, we had some interesting conversations about what we've seen work really well and what we've seen maybe not work as well in some of these events. So I think one of the important things to remember is that, you know, partner advisory councils can provide a really valuable opportunity to strengthen those relationships with your partners. 
the goal really is to gain insight and validate what you've learned, as well as to communicate um, to your partners, you know, maybe critical issues that you have or, or new activities that are going to be coming forward to them, um, but also to uncover issues and set priorities. They need to be actionable. Um, um, and thinking about, you know, what are some of the, the right structures, the agenda, location, logistics, you know, think about who your members are going to be. Are you going to structure this as a single advisory council across all partners, or do you want to focus this based on partner type, perhaps based on region, or even based on persona? Perhaps have an advisory council that's dedicated to owners of those businesses, you know, some key owners, perhaps those that are focused on selling versus marketing, or even the technical advisory councils. Right? So think about the right structure, um, giving your partner to demographics in your ecosystem, um, but also how frequently um, and what location. And that actually can be critical. You know, your partners are busy and they're running their business. And um, for them to stop what they're doing, to invest time and dedicate time to come be a, participate in these events, um, is going to take them out of that opportunity, it takes them out of their business cycle. So, um, you know, it has to be a location that's easy to, for them to get to that actually is compelling. Um, and it can't be so frequent that they actually cannot be successful in running their business if they're attending these constantly, right? So think about the, the right um, frequency of these. In terms of the topics, um, there are things that you're going to need to and want to represent to your partners, whether it be a new strategy, perhaps a new product that's coming out, a roadmap, um, maybe a critical change in, in your go-to-market, um, perhaps a new product um, that's going to be entering. There are also things that you're going to want to make sure that you're finding out from your partners what do they want to discuss with you. So making sure you have a balanced agenda that allows you to do an upfront opportunity to ask your partners and let them select a topic or two that is a critical need to them. Um, you know, perhaps give them a, a list of choices or even an opportunity just to provide where they think they need to spend time. One of the most important areas is around who you're going to invite from your business. Right? So um, you want to have the right level of representation, obviously, depending on what the topics are. You need to have executives in your business so the partners understand and see the commitment that you have to them and to the channel. Um, but again, there are different individuals that you might invite based on what the topics are going to be and, and what your intended um, goals are for that meeting. Hey, so Kathy, you know, I've been involved in these both as a partner and as a manufacturer. And, and as I started out the conversation on the slide, I've, I've looked through the goods and the bads of these. A couple questions for you. Um, one is, um, what do you think about, the, you know, a key objective in terms of follow-up? And, and for me, the biggest thing and the most value I ever saw out of any of these are the organizations that, that actually continue to follow up and really drive uh, an agenda post these sort of events. And then the second piece, the second question is, when you talk about attendees, I've had conversations with folks lately about when, when we're dealing with our channel, are we also bringing direct people in as well? And are, are we, you know, taking some of those perhaps channel barriers uh, that, are, that are out there and, and using count, things like councils to diffuse uh, tension sometimes? So, sorry, that's two questions. <laughs> no, they're great questions. I'm glad you brought them up. You know, the first, let's focus on the first, um, and that was really around, um, you know, the follow-up piece of it. And, and it's a really critical point. I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't bring it up when I was sort of talking about some of the highlights. Um, and that is you need to follow up with your partners. They've invested their time and effort. They've shared, you know, in, in some cases in, in a difficult way, they shared their what, what their experiences are, um, positive or negative, with you. And you're usually asking them for insights. You're asking them for direction. You're asking them to be transparent about what their needs are or where their issues or concerns are. One of the most important things to do is then after these meetings, make sure you're planning your team's focused in time and attention and resources to, to think of this not as a one-and-done effort, right? What you'll find in those meetings often is that you're going to identify and uncover issues that need to be addressed, making sure you're communicating back to your partners what you've heard, what you're going to do with that information, and make sure that they understand there are steps happening so they feel that their time invested actually had a return on that investment. And you're going to need to do this time over time. Time, right? Because over time, they'll sort of they'll stop sharing with you if they feel like you're not delivering against um, that information and those insights. But you'll also see as we walk through each one of these voice of the partner elements, that feedback, that follow-up, that communication back to partners is absolutely essential for success across this entire continuum. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. Uh, the other. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. 
the second area that you brought up is a really interesting one. That is, you know, who do you bring in? We talked about, you know, right, right level. You know, if they're going to talk about product, you want to bring a product leader. You're going to talk about, you know, you always want to have some executives from the channel side, but also executives from the from the C level suite. If, if they're not channel representative, you know, bring in as many of the relevant um, individuals. If you're dealing with any channel conflict issues, it may be valuable to bring in the direct side of the house as well. Again, be transparent. If there are challenges or issues, the partners are feeling that, they're probably talking about it. Bring them, bring in those individuals and actually have an opportunity to sit at the table together and to work through some of those opportunities to, to sort of make placate that channel conflict, maybe build out plans for how do you address those issues. Yeah, the transparency piece is a big, big thing on all of that. And I think an interesting side to that is if you do open it up to a broader audience coming in, whether it's C-level, uh, whatever it is, um, executive level, they need to be on the same transparency message, uh, have the same transparency message as everybody else in the room too, right? I'm just, I'm reliving some, some past experiences, right? And uh, have, having everybody on the same page on that is, uh, is, 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 a, is a big part of it. Absolutely. I can't agree more. Okay. All right, uh, so the, the next piece, the partner surveys. I, I know this is something where you've been, you've been spending a lot of time, Kathy, and, and, and have uh, a lot of focus. As a matter of fact, uh, you did a great uh, newsletter for us a couple of months ago on that. And when we do follow-ups for this, we'll make sure that we provide a, a link to that because I think this is a, I think this is a great piece. Yeah, and sometimes when companies think about voice of the partner, they think specifically around their partner experience surveys. And it's something that I know is um, is really top of mind for a lot of our clients. I'm spending a lot of time providing some guidance in this regard. You know, what should they survey? How should they survey it? What should that look like? What are best practices? As well as um, really understanding, you know, how do we evaluate that data? So there are a number of things to consider when you're, if you're thinking about this. Um, you know, really want to focus on the planning and process of this initiative frequency and design, the structure and components. When we talk about the, the frequency and design, what I truly want to recommend is that you think about this as a once a year survey, maybe twice a year at most. The survey should be the same year over year, so you can, you can map trends, see where you have improvements. It's meant to give you a level of satisfaction of the partner's experience of working with you. It's not meant to actually deep dive in, the, in specific areas. So think about that. There are some, some recommendations we have from um, a serious decision standpoint around where to focus and how to structure that. So when you think about um, you know, what we define as the five essential pillars of uh, partner experience, we, we sort of categorize that into those five elements of products and profits. So are your products meeting the needs of the customers? Is the quality strong? Is there enough profitability in the product or business opportunity for the partner for them to have a sustainable business offering? Um, people in alignment is the second area. So are the resources that you put in place to support the partners adequately trained, focused, and committed to their success? Is it easy to do business with them? Are they getting the information they need in a timely fashion? And the third is programs and tools. So the, the programs and tools you make available to your partners, are they doing the job? Are they helping them to provide their value forward, whether that be sales or marketing or technical? Um, process and technology, this is where we find a lot of challenge around ease of doing business, right? The systems you provide your partners, are they easy to navigate? Are they getting the information they need? Or are they burdensome and they're actually leading partners to not actually engage um, and take advantage of some of the, of the investments you've made? And then finally, but not to be overlooked, is promotion and communication. What about your incentives? Have you structured? Are they motivating the right behavior from a partner's perspective? And what we find often is communication is an area of pain for a lot of the partners. You know, they're not seeing the messages. They're being over with emails. Um, do they have the right level of connections? Is there personalized communication for them? Or are you broadcasting the same communications to everyone? Um, so these are the, some of the areas that we recommend that you sort of structure your surveys around. When we talk about the, the components and the structure, and some of the things that we provide as recommendations and, and what you might want to consider if you're not doing this today is get a general level of satisfaction across each one of these areas. You can rate that year over year or, or survey over survey. But also allow the partners to very clearly respond to um, what their level of satisfaction is on individual elements within this as well as what the importance of those elements are. What I've often seen when I'm reviewing these results is that if there's not an importance level, and I'm actually speaking to partners after the fact, they might have indicated they're at a, from a one to five, they might be at a one at one of these areas. But the importance of that area to them in the business 
might be a one as well. So it's not as critical. They might have something that's important to a five on the top of the scale, and their level of satisfaction today is a three. It actually might be a higher need for that partner and a higher need for that supplier to invest time to improve whatever that experience level is. Um, so it's, a, it's an important thing to think about is, is having the partners evaluate not just their level of satisfaction, but for each of those elements, what is the importance of that element to them? Yeah, you, you and I have discussed that, right? And that importance piece is to be redundant. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it really is. Um, and we'll talk about this a bit, but one of the things, as you mentioned before, is just make sure you're communicating back to your partners what you've heard. Um, the Partner Experience Survey is meant to, to survey the level of satisfaction, right? What you'll find in that is that the, I expect that you'll uncover those areas that you need to focus deeper on, and then in those is why you're going to do this only once or twice a year, because when you identify those elements, perhaps in the prospect and profitability area, there's subcategorizations that might indicate a major need. Um, then you're going to drill down on that, and that time in between, you're going to work on evaluating what those challenges are, getting the specific pulse information from those partners as to the details behind that, and create project plans to solve, to solve those problems. Yeah, I mean, it's really a lot of value add there. So one thing I wanted to share with the audience is just because I've been doing so many of these, there's a couple things to think about. You know, it's not just knowing what the best practices are, but knowing what not to do. Um, sometimes, actually, that's where I want to focus my attention because I think just avoid the pitfalls right, and focus um, on, on not sort of stepping in those holes yourself. Um, so a couple of things that I've seen that, that you know, it would be great to be aware of ahead of time if there's something you're, you're thinking about is that not to confuse the customer experience survey with a partner experience survey. I have seen some executives um, from the C-level want to just say, okay, we already have customer experience, we already have a net promoter structure. Um, let's just push that to partners. These are not the same things, right? The partner's experience is looking at so much more than what would evaluate a customer's experience through. Net promoter scores do not necessarily equate. Um, the, if you do a, a find and replace on um, customer versus partner in those surveys, about 90% of that survey would not be relevant to the partner, not provide you the insights that you need to be able to evaluate their satisfaction. So, you know, just say no if that's something you're directed to do and really step back and think about what are the evaluation factors for the partner's business relationship with you. Again, the relationship is purely not just the product. Um, the second is, is that be careful about falling into the, the thing of thinking that, okay, there's a survey, we want to get as much information out of our partners as we can in this one shot. Be very clear about the, what the purpose is. The purpose of a partner experience survey should be to evaluate the partner's level of satisfaction working with you. It should not be to gather individual partner data. And so I've seen some cases where those have sort of crept in, those types of questions have crept in um, to the partner experience surveys. Ideally, a partner experience area is going to be anonymous. There will be some demographic information might request that you can actually um, sort the data to do better analysis on the back end. Um, but if you have an anonymous um, you know, response, partners partner may be more willing to be a, more frank about where their concerns or challenges are, and that's what you want to gather, those types of information. Um, so if you're looking at asking questions about what their previous revenues were, what their planned revenues are for the next year, this is not the process to do that and do that through a different means. And then finally, I've also seen in reviewing some of these surveys where there are questions been asked that a supplier should actually already have the answer for. Um, you know, questions like, how often do you use our systems? What's your adoption rate of our existing programs? That's data that you should all already have uh, through other means. Um, so make sure that you really focus these surveys on the experience level. Right? So perhaps you ask them open-ended questions about what can we do to improve um, the relationship with you? What can we do to improve and add, you know, to increase higher levels of revenue um, through through the partnership. Um, so you can ask those types of open-ended questions, but, but be careful not to ask questions that you potentially already have the answer to within your own um, database sources. Right. So the partner interviews and channel account teams, you know, moving on to the, to, the, to the next element, to me there's a little bit of irony here, and this is a question for you as we start to tee this up. For me this is harder because it takes more uh, effort and it takes uh, it, it takes more resources. Yet in conversations, I find people more comfortable in doing this than they are in, in some of the surveys that they've done. So uh, you know, I've just seen a little bit of irony in this as I've as I've had some conversations. So I'm curious if you see any of that, or am I just talking to people <laughs> who, uh, yeah, you, who don't have a clue? Yeah, just like with any other sort of campaign, um, you'll see survey response rates are going to be you know in ranges around you know, sometimes 1 to, to 20, 25%, 25% is pretty high. 
So there's a big portion of your partner base that you're not hearing from, right? And unfortunately, it's probably that partner base that it's critical to understand why they're not engaging with you, right? Because there might be some, based on that elusiveness of that partner, there may be some unique um, concerns or levels of satisfaction that, that you need to get insight on. And the way to do that is to, to think more comprehensively, um, supplement your surveys with, with interviews. Um, and those can be done face-to-face, -face, through phone interviews, um, group group feedback forms, it can also be sort of, you know, done like you would it sort of a, um, in a, within group organizations. Think about how you can accomplish that, though. So you have resources that are already engaging with partners on an ongoing basis. For your managed partners, those are going to be the account teams, perhaps the channel account managers, the CAMs or partner account managers, the PAMs. Um, Make sure that you're including um, not only just that they're listening to partners when they have issues, and that they're actually recording those those insights somewhere that is going to be centrally a central repository, so that those that are running um, or focused on partner experience are seeing that. A lot of times, that data, is, that information is being transacted, um, that's being shared with those partner account managers, but there's no location for them to promote that and to sort of catalog that. Um, they can also actually serve as, as actually do sort of mini surveys um, and be a part of their ongoing meetings with these partners, especially if you look at their annual reviews or their QBRs, right? So including some of those, if there's critical areas you want to get them to evaluate, you can actually have them facilitate that through those meetings. The other thing to think about is um, whether or not you can leverage your distributors and the brokers that you engage with that manage your subpartners, those that you don't have direct relationships with. There might be opportunities to have them also provide the similar insights when they hear these things that are being informally provided to them based on um, partner communications and or for them to facilitate these surveys or these or interviews or other feedback forums um, so you can gain those insights from those larger masses of partners as well that you may not have direct connections with. Okay, the next one is the partner communities and events. This is really important for me. I built a lot of relationships this way with, with uh, other partners who ended up being my confidants and, 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 and folks that I bounced ideas off uh, for, for years. And a lot of that, Kathy, was through some of the regional events that took place, but there were also national events where I, I saw folks as well. But I got an awful lot out of the regional events. Right, and, and this is the important thing to consider. From a voice of the partner, think about voices from the crowd. Right? These are activities that you're probably already investing in as a supplier. You may or may, may not be structuring um, opportunities for those partners to provide feedback to you, perhaps sessions, working sessions, uh, feedback sessions, insight sessions, right, where you, it's the partners get the voice, um, even panels sessions, right? And are you, in, when you do have those, are you gathering those insights and putting them in a location and information where people can diagnose that, evaluate it, and then provide some priorities based on what they learn? So think about the events that you have sponsored today, that's your partner summits, maybe regional events or even local meetups. Um, but also consider the online partner communities and the social media networks that you make available. Perhaps you have um, chat forums or kiosks that you allow partners to engage in that are really, that you control. How are you gathering those insights? Are you leading? Sometimes you can ask questions. You know, do spot questions here and there saying, hey, can you give us your feedback on this? Um, what's your current satisfaction of this? Again, use those as opportunities to facilitate communication and bi-directional conversation. And then finally, think about those opportunities to hear from partners on those activities that you don't manage and control. So um, association meetings or industry events, channel conferences, open social media networks, chances are your partners being vocal about their happiness and their level of satisfaction in those events as well. Um, see if there's a way to catalog that, that information and then to include that within your overall structure. Okay, so we've gone through those listening elements and now reference and advocacy programs. Yeah, and I, I know we're getting close on time, so I'm going to try to hit this quickly, but I think um, everyone will understand the value here. A lot of times what we see is these reference and advocacy programs are just extensions of what we do from a direct perspective, um, which may or may not be the best solution. So really think about it from, from this being owned by the channel marketing organization or being championed um, by the channel marketing organization to make sure that they're ideal for the partners. When you think about referral programs, partner-specific referral programs, this can actually mean new leads or new customer referrals or referrals related to prospective new partners. So partners are peer referrals, a really strong recruitment um, vehicle. So, you know, making sure that your program, if you have one, is established to reflect these two potentials. Um, partner references. Again, a lot of companies have formalized customer reference programs. Make sure that you have a partner reference program. You know, if partners are willing to speak on suppliers' behalf to the market, to press and media, to analysts like myself, um, to other partners. Um, and this can be hugely 
instrumental in, in driving and promoting success, not only of you and your brand and your offerings, but of your partners and profile them as a thought leader. Um, this can include speaking engagements, quotes, or written documents. So think about formalizing a program, even reference calls. Think about formalizing a program um, with this in mind. And then finally, the ultimate goal really is to have your partner serve as advocates. Um, they understand your offering, your needs, uh, the needs of the customer in a way that, that many other individuals don't, um, perhaps even that your own team doesn't because they're so close, especially with specific knowledge around regional verticals or even specializations. Um, and so consider channel ambassadorship, thought leadership programs, influencer programs for partners, as well as um, really having partners serve as market or peer advocates, really promoting the value, extending that, that that strength of their experience of working with you if you've done a great job. You know, many partners will be, can, will be happy to be vocal about that and serve as strong advocates. Okay, I think a great place to wrap it up for everybody is how do you get started? Right, so I, you know, one of the things I've sort of referred to throughout here and I haven't specifically called it out is that almost, um, you know, the first step if it hasn't been already is to make sure you're signing ownership. We really recommend that um, there be established a voice of the partner or partner experience function within the channel marketing organization. You know, at least one individual that is fully dedicated to focusing on this um, because of this criticality to the success of your channel business. Um, and really think of this comprehensively. So really consider the state of partner experience across and the partner engagement across all those different elements. Um, in any regard, you're going to look at really defining those goals and making sure that you're providing um, providing a comprehensive approach. Think about the core components, though. This certain the organization, these individuals that are in this function, should really think about whether or not they need to segment the partners by partner type, by partner tier, by region, um, or by role or persona. Do you need to look at insights separately? Um, there should be a very strategic focus on information gathering. So how are you going to do that? We've shown you a couple elements that, that can be looked at sort of across the board. Um, really looking at that information and prioritizing. You're not going to, be able to do everything, but focusing very clearly on those things that have the highest impact or importance to your partner. And then sharing that information internally. What are your prior what did you learn? What are your priorities and what are you going to do about it? Share that information with your partners as well. They need to know what you've heard to resonate back to them what's important, what the, what other their peers are saying as well. And then the last two bullets can be sort of tied together, which is this should lead to new actions. It's not just evaluating where they're at and then evaluating next year. This should spur action to actually drive towards growth goals, to improving experiences with partners. And you need to communicate that back to the partners continually. What have you done? What have you heard? What are you going to do about it? And what has it been done once it's completed? Um, so making sure that that closed loop communication path is happening, not only internally, but essentially with partners as well. All right, Kathy, thank you. That was a lot of information there. We really appreciate you uh, joining us today. We've uh, got a couple minutes for Q&A here. So, looking here, Kathy, let's see. Oh, here we go. This one's for you. It says, um, I'm trying to get buy-in internally from my team and company on the value of a, a comprehensive, a real survey plan, uh, not just a one-off. Any advice on... Um, where to start? <laughs> I get I guess the starting piece there, but this is this looks like it's more a slide. This looks like it's more around uh, specifically around the survey side of things. Right, and, and that's fine. It's, sometimes it's a great way to start because you want to evaluate where your partners are today. Um, a lot of times we actually recommend this be something you do in preparation for your annual planning, right, because you might, in addition to try aligning your channel goals and priorities along the corporate goals and, and priorities, what's your revenue goal, are there new products being released, is there new growth strategies, perhaps around emerging markets and new regions or new routes to market that you need to address from a channel perspective. You also need to look internally. Are there things systematically with your programs and processes and activities with partners that need to be addressed? Because what you will find, if there's a level of dissatisfaction with your partners, you could easily lose those partners to your competitors. Or if you have recruitment goals with new partners, you may not be able to achieve recruitment success. So sort of being up diagnosed up front to understand, you know, it shouldn't cost a tremendous amount to actually establish a survey. Um, you could talk to a number of different survey vendors. Even some of your channel vendors um, are able to sort of facilitate these for you. So um, I don't think the cost of starting this is the big initiative. I think where the cost comes into play is uh, what it's going to take to solve the problems you uncover. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Really, once again, really appreciate you taking some time with us today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you very much. It was wonderful to join everyone today.